All right, good morning. My name is Mary Scharf, and I am the 33rd District PTA Director of Budget and Finance. Welcome to our first ever budget workshop. We have a few housekeeping notes about the Zoom meeting before we get started. We ask that all participants please mute yourself during the presentation. Please ask questions in the chat section and the panelists will review the questions and answer the questions as we go along. We will be sharing video segments covering the PowerPoint that we share with you. After each video segment, we will have some polls and other activities that we will, and we will answer as many of the submitted questions as possible. One of our goals at the 33rd District is to increase our avenues of communication with our members. Finance team's contact information is on slide two of the handout. And 33rd District PTA has a variety of social media accounts, including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So our speaking, our training team today is Lisa Umimatsu, and she is the 33rd District PTA Treasurer. We have Emmy Morimoto, and she is the 33rd District PTA Financial Secretary. Me, which I've already introduced. Um, and Flora Fazard, 33rd District PTA Tax and Government Filing Consultant. So what is a budget? California State PTA Toolkit says, the budget is a financial representation of the goals, activities, and operations of a, PT a PTA expects to conduct during a specific time period. So now we'll introduce, I mean, we'll start the first video, what is in a budget? And these will be um, slides four through five of your handout. Here are elements that your budget should include, the name of your PTA, the time period of the budget. So the budget coincides with the term of office, which is also the association's fiscal year. So for next year, the beginning date would be July 1, 2022, and the ending date would be June 30, 2023. Also include the beginning balance, which is the starting balance at the beginning of the next PTA fiscal year. Whatever the ending balance is on June 30, 2022 will be your starting balance on July 1, 2022. For the income section, this is your projected income. Income from past budgets can be reviewed and you can determine your best estimates for the coming year. Also include a separate line for income not belonging to the unit this includes the portion of your membership dues, which is forwarded to your council. This amount varies from council to council, so be sure to check your bylaws. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Include all your anticipated expenses. So similar to the income section, the expenses are your projected expenses and past budget expenses can be reviewed to determine your best estimates. Expenses not belonging to the unit, we'll discuss this in more detail on the next slide as well, but this includes a portion of your membership dues that you forward to your council. The ending balance is what you end up with after adding your beginning balance and all the income, then subtracting all expenses. For the ending balance, there's no set number to leave here, but at the very least, it's recommended that there's enough funds to carry over to the next year to pay for items until your main fundraiser kicks off. These items can include certain bills, organizational expenses like your PTA insurance, or if you have one, a website, and programs such as welcome back events. Um, and in terms of your main fundraiser, if for example, you're a high school PTA that runs snack bar at football games, you'll need startup money and money to purchase inventory. Also be sure to include the date that the budget was approved by the board and the association. On this next slide is a sample budget. At the top is the PTA's name, Awesome Elementary PTA. The budget is titled Proposed Budget for 2022 to 2023 because it'll need to be approved by the board and association. So until then, it's called the Proposed Budget. This first line is titled Carry Forward Balance. As mentioned previously, this is the ending balance of the previous year. So if you're working on next year's budget, this is the amount you end up with on June 30, 2022. And since it's not June 30th yet, insert the amount that you anticipate ending up with. 
In the income section, note that membership dues is listed on two lines. One is noted as membership dues income unit portion only, and the other total membership dues income. Membership dues income unit portion only. This is where to record membership dues received by cash, check, or your own unit website, for example, my PT Easy. It should reflect only the portion kept by your unit. As an example, if your membership dues are $10 and $4 remains with your unit, that $4 is called the unit portion and goes here. And the $6, which is forwarded to your council, is called the non unit portion. So for every $4 recorded here, $6 is recorded into the non-unit income line here. Uh, one quick and easy way to check if you're doing the allocation correctly is that the number of members in the membership dues income line should match the number of members in the non-unit dues section. And using the previous example where dues cost $10, you'll notice that there's $500 here in the membership dues income unit portion line. So if $4 of the $10 remains with your unit, then the $500 here represents $500 divided by $4, which equals 125, so 125 members. So we would expect then that 125 members would also be in the membership non-unit dues line here. So 125 times $6, the amount which is forwarded to your council equals $750. So we would expect to see $750 here. Please remember though, that the amount that you forward varies from council to council, and this is just an example. Many units also use TOTEM, which is an online way to join PTA. And when members sign up through TOTEM, TOTEM transfers the unit portion to your bank account. And you don't need to worry about the portion of your dues that you should forward to your council because TOTEM takes care of that. Uh, it's recommended to use different budget line items for different sources of membership income, so it's easier to keep track of. Other items in the income section represent projected income from programs, fundraisers, and donations. Uh, for fundraisers in particular, fundraising income is the gross income from fundraisers. So you'll need to list each fundraiser individually. The expense for conducting each fundraiser should be listed under expenses individually by fundraiser. In this particular example, $7,500 is projected for the fall fundraiser income. And looking at the expense section, it also has a fundraiser line. And here, scrolling down, there's your fall fundraiser expense. And you'll note that there's an anticipated expense of $3,750. So going back up to donations here, um, be sure to have a separate income line to record donations that come in with memberships. The total projected income at the bottom here is all of your anticipated income, which totals $19,530. In the expense section, expenses are broken down into program services, special fundraising expenses, organizational expenses, and expenses not belonging to unit. For program services, uh, this uh, could include items such as spirit wear, reflections, and honorary service awards. For fundraising, here's where each fundraiser is listed individually. For non-unit uh, or expenses not belonging to unit, similar to the income section, there should be a separate line for non-unit expenses. This includes membership non-unit dues. This is a portion of dues received by your unit that you pay to your council. Uh, be sure to keep an eye on the non-unit dues in the income section up here and the non-unit dues in the expense section down here because ultimately these two should be the same. Whatever you take in that needs to be forwarded to your council should equal what you actually forwarded to your council. Uh, Founders Day, all money received for Founders Day should be forwarded to your council as well. The projected cash balance on June 30, 2023 is a carry forward balance from the very top up here. And in this case, $4,250 plus all of your income minus all of your expenses, which in this example ends up as $5,530. And at the bottom, indicate the date that the proposed budget was approved by the board and association. 
Okay, so um, Flora, are there any questions in the chat that we want to share out loud? Oops, you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, one in the um, in the chat was regarding the budget module for my PTEZ. Unfortunately, a shortcoming of that module is that whatever you input later is overridden or overlaid. So uh, they say to make copy, keep hard copies or input them somewhere else so that you have um, revised budgets as you go along because you really need those and we'll talk about that later. But unfortunately, the module in my PTEZ uh, only has the most current version in, in the, on their file. So you have to make a copy of the previous versions. And there's one more that says, I was told in the past that income and expense should be equal. Is this no longer true? That was uh, something that was said some time ago with regard to programs in that uh, they said programs should not be making money and that's for fundraising. And so when we budgeted those programs, uh, they said revenue and expense should be equal. And that was true at that time. Uh, I don't think that is true now because we now know, uh, and we didn't know in the past that for example, Spiritwear is a program. Well, we certainly do expect to, um, to earn money in spirit wear. And the reason why it's a program is because an inventory is kept all year and sales are all year. So it's our business, it's not a fundraiser. And you'll see in a lot of uh, government um, papers, they interchange the word special events and fundraising. They term fundraising as special events. So a spirit wear t-shirt is a program, a carnival t-shirt is a, a fundraiser. Okay, and then there is a question that's actually gonna be on uh, our upcoming poll. So we'll hold off on uh, answering that one, David. Um, are there any other questions regarding what uh, elements belong on a budget? I have a, a question. Interactive, uh, sure, go ahead. Um, is this yearbook, um, is, is that the same thing as Spirit Wear, where yearbook is a program and not a fundraiser? Um, it's a sale, and so, but it is once a year, um, so that would be more of a fundraiser. When you're uh, in the tax world, uh, those kinds of things would be sales and cost of goods sold, but we don't have that. So I would say a yearbook is kind of a, a fundraiser because you don't sell it all year. It's a special event, you sell it once a year and you don't keep an inventory all year. Okay, not, thank you. Not ordinarily. I think it's one of those calls where just make the call <laughs> that you feel comfortable with. It's not, you know, um, in stone. And Flora, correct me if I'm wrong, if the intent of, say, a yearbook is to actually um, earn a profit, like you sell it for more than what, you, what your cost is, then would that also tip it toward being the, the fundraiser side? As yeah, that would be the fundraiser in? side. And that's the odd thing about it, because we're trying to fit in either a fundraiser or a program into uh, you know to those two categories, but there is a third category on the tax uh, return, and that's like I said, sales and cost of goods sold, where a lot of that would go into. But you know that's too complicated. We don't want to you know mess with that. So you know we make a decision between either a fundraiser or a program. And when I look at the fundraiser, the five hundred one c three fundraiser guidelines. What they do say is you keep an inventory all year. It's your business. In other words, a program is your business. And our business is selling spirit wear for a lot of units. May not be in all units, but most units, their business is selling spirit wear. And so that would make it a program. But a special event, you know, something that happens once a year, you don't keep inventory, that's what they would call a fundraiser. Like I said, they use those terms interchangeably. 
Okay, now Grace asks if there's a limited amount of fundraisers allowed and um, I'm probably going to be blabbing about that in the last video <laughs> <laughs> training. So we'll just uh, hold that thought and then let us know if you have questions about it afterwards. And then Jillian's asking about um, teacher appreciation, whether that's supposed to be considered a program or not. I, I see it both ways, either as a program or hospitality. Um, we separate these as best we can. The most important thing is to be consistent. Don't put teacher appreciation one, uh, the fall one in hospitality and the spring one in, you know, programs. So consistency is important, but uh, we try to apply the criteria. I would, and I, I've done in the past, where if there is a new line item that you're creating or all of the old line items, I would um, uh, prepare a document assigning that program to say, okay, these are the criteria, I'm putting it here. And then refer to that every time you input data so you don't deviate from that criteria. And it makes it easier when you're inputting your expenses and your revenue. Say, okay, it goes here. Alrighty, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share a what's wrong with this budget thing on the screen. And if you see things that look out of whack to you, whatever, um, throw your, um, observations into the chat. And um, so this will be up for several minutes. Um, in the meantime, if you still have other questions, then um, go ahead and raise your virtual hand and then we'll, we'll uh, call on you. Okay, so there's that. So. You notice anything that's missing or looks incorrect. Um, also, just know that don't go and whip out your calculators and try and add, add the columns and make sure that they're correct because any mistakes are not that kind of mistake. Okay. Ah, very good. Oh, good, good. So no approvals by executive board and association. Now one could argue, well, maybe it's before they presented it to the EB or the association, but there is not even a space for someone to put those appropriate dates. No year, very good. We have no idea when this budget is from. Um, it doesn't say proposed budget. Well, that was just me being kind of weaselly because I didn't <laughs> want it to get <laughs> kind of vague, but uh, Yes, that's true if uh, we don't know. Okay, now, oopsie, people are throwing more stuff in. Okay, someone caught our, our dues thing here. Yes, you'll see that here we have um, a membership at 10, uh, 100 at $10 dues. And then in the organizational expense, there's um, the membership expense to council, but really it should be here. It should be uh, $4 is what the, this unit is keeping. So it'd be hundred times $4. And the remaining $6 would be down on the bottom in a um, income not belonging to unit line. And then this one also does not belong in the organizational expense section, but down below, at an uh, expense not belonging to unit line. And let's see. Ooh, good. Grace says that the fall fundraiser income shouldn't show as net income, correct? That we want the amount here to be the gross amount. So maybe, maybe it would be 8,000 here and then a separate line item here as 3,500 as expense. But yes, you wanna make sure you're accounting for all the money that's coming in. Any other observations? I have to go through my answer key and see what you guys caught here. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Hold on, okay. Got that, good, got that. Oh, I have to say that some of these are a little bit uh, more advanced. So there are a couple more that don't feel bad that uh, you're not seeing them, but they're, they are important. 
There we are, and Bill caught that same uh, kind of thing that's applicable to fundraisers at the totem donations. You don't net the fees out in the income side, but that should belong somewhere on the expense side. So that's good. You guys are catching most of these, so good for you. Um, There's a question uh, or an input about field trips uh, being a program not to get to school. And uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, gifts to school is not encouraged to be used as a line item because it sounds like we're just giving money to the school for no particular reason. And uh, some schools list all of their like for example, uh, field trips or anything they want to send to the district on behalf of the school as one lump sum item to the gift to the school. So they could have a gift to school of $40,000. This is not correct. Each, each um, approved activity or program has to be listed. And that would be such a red flag to any IRS auditor if they're looking at this and seeing a gift to school, a slush fund of, of $40,000. So we want to make sure as these uh, programs or activities are approved by the association that we budget them in each line item. And we can call them not so much gift to school, maybe a special project or a special program to indicate special means one time. So a lot of these may be one time, um, um, I don't wanna say gift, but uh, checks to the school for a particular region, field, field trips, benches, uh, shades, you know, they put up in, in, in the uh, playground. So we wanna make sure we isolate these uh, items. Okay. Do you wanna address that? What is projected net operations? Project, oh, okay, uh, projected net operations. That means this is just current year. Your balance brought forward is your cash, which is a result of all your operations from previous years. And that's what your beginning balance is, your, your cash balance. What this is, is what's happened during the current year only. Money that came in, money that went out. So uh, we can see that more money came in as income uh, rather than expenses. So we have $105 more money came in than went out. And, you know, that's fine. That adds to your cash balance and your projected cash balance, as we see here, if, if it's final, we'll go to the next year. I, I know a lot of schools have made considerable bank this year selling spirit wear because of COVID, spirit wear wasn't sold. And so I've seen quite a bit of spirit wear income. And so uh, cash balances have been greatly uh, increased. And I know that we're trying to spend down, a lot of units are trying to spend down some of that money. We don't wanna show such an increase in our carry over. And so uh, the question is, and I, I guess there's a question coming up, but the point is that you can project a loss in, in the budget for the current year because you have the cash balance that will pay for it. Because you want to reduce your cash balance, you have to show a shortfall or more expenses than revenue in the current year. And that's fine. And I've seen a lot of units with their CTTR1s. This is the report that we're gonna do at the end of the year thinking they cannot report a loss. You can, as long as you have the cash balance brought forward. Okay, so your projected net operations can be a loss. Okay, and I'm just gonna run over my sneaky ones that I included real quick before we move on to the next video. Um, Nikel did notice that um, we have association student body donation of 300. And then on this other side here on the income side, we have an associated student body fundraiser for 300, the exact same amount. Now, 
this is something that maybe could be a little bit of a red flag because maybe the ASB themselves, that's their actual fundraiser. Um, they're the ones who are putting in the volunteer work and, and PTA is just accepting their money and then depositing it and then paying it back out to um, ASB. And that's called commingling of funds because that money is not from a actual PTA fundraiser, uh, but an ASB fundraiser. So um, you wanna make sure that you avoid things like that. Um, and if, oh, go ahead, Flora. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, the commingling of funds that, that Lisa has mentioned, um, those funds must be recorded as revenue to the PTA unit. And so uh, it's not passed through. And one may think, oh, I'm just passing it through. Well, that's money laundering. Passing through money to give to someone else, they do not share the tax exempt purpose that we have. And so we're collecting money on behalf of the tax exempt or another exempt purpose that's not ours. And so the, you may say, oh, okay, well, what about the membership pass through income? That is one organization, the California Congress of Parents and Teachers. So that's passed through because we're one organization. And I've seen it in one instance where the um, commingling of funds revenue put the unit above the $50,000 revenue. And so they had to pay two years running $500 each year for a tax repair to prepare a 990EC because the money they collected for the school put them over the $50,000 mark and, and they could have just filed a postcard. So that was $1,000 of expense that they would not have incurred. So there's other things to consider. So do not collect money on behalf that PTA does not have ultimate control. The point is, does PTA have control over the funds that you're collecting? In this case, we do not. The, we have to get it, give it to the ASB. It's not a choice. It's what something we said we would you know, do because it's their money, so. Okay, thank you, Flora. Um, and then one last thing I wanted to point out that teacher appreciation, um, we have a, a pretty large amount here. Um, $2,500 when considering that our total expenses is less than $9,000. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the future, in, uh, for the end, um, but just uh, I wanted to include it on this exercise because uh, it works out well. And I'm gonna stop sharing that. And I think Mary, you can introduce the next clip. Uh, yes, the next clip is developing the budget. And um, that'll be slide six in your handout. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk about the budget timeline. And I know at first glance, it looks cumbersome and confusing, but there is a reason for each step. So I'm going to hopefully explain that. Uh, just uh, for historical purposes, um, the reason why we have this process is to accommodate summer payments. And what I mean is that sometimes uh, units need to pay things in July and August. And in the past, they could not do that because the budget was not approved in the new year by the association. So this is a process where uh, payments can be made in July and August prior to the next year's association meeting. So uh, the first bullet point is board elects budget committee and develops the proposed budget. Um, I would say after your elections, you should have a board elect meeting. And the first order of business would be to make your appointments. Those um, standing chairs or whoever that are not elected but appointed by the president and the board uh, should uh, take place so you'll have more people on your board. And then those um, appointees can serve on the budget committee. Uh, then the second point of business, business would be to select the budget committee. The president selects the members of the budget committee and the treasurer elect uh, chairs that committee. Um, they come up with a budget and then they will present it to the board elect. And so uh, the board elect would take a look 
And we need to consider, and the budget committee needs to consider the carryover um, balance also, not just the budget line items, but your carryover cash to make sure that you have enough money to start the new year. It's like startup cash, okay? So then the um, board elect may approve the uh, budget or revise it. And then uh, it says to propose the um, budget to the current board for approval. And the reason why we do that is because the board elect is not in charge yet. So their term of office starts July 1st. So the current board uh, is still has the fiduciary responsibility for safeguarding PTA assets, which is cash. So um, uh, as far as presenting it, it could be uh, anyone uh, that can answer, preferably answer questions about the budget. So ordinarily, probably the president elect and treasurer elect would make that presentation to the current board. And uh, the reason why we involve the current board also is because they know what's going on and maybe the board elect may not be aware of uh, everything that is happening. So uh, the current board may uh, have some plans that they uh, that have not materialized yet. So it's just that coordination and communication between the board elect and the current board uh, to uh, approve the proposed budget. Uh, then the uh, proposed budget that has been approved by the board elect and the current board is presented to the uh, association at the last meeting of the association for that year. Uh, if the budget is approved by the association, then they will release funds for summer payments. So the board elect should have available list of summer payments that they wish to be released. For example, spirit wear, $10,000. Teacher welcome back lunch, $600. So it would be anything that they feel needs to be paid prior to the first association meeting of the new year. When we move into the new year, you'll notice that the proposed budget becomes a revised budget. And this is where the uh, now current board uh, may make some changes or you know look it over they have their meetings in july and august but now it's the revised budget that goes to the board the current board which used to be the board elect, but this is the new year okay and then the revised budget is presented for approval at the first association meeting of the year and so this would ordinarily be a board recommendation uh, uh, from the board, they may say the board uh, approves this budget and then present it to the association. If there's any changes, you know, those need to be made. And then the association will release the funds that, uh, that um, payments need to be made before the next association meeting. And releasing funds, uh, we're gonna talk about that later, but um, just because the budget approves doesn't mean the money's in the bank. The money needs to be in the bank, and that's why we release funds. So uh, because a program is approved doesn't mean people can run out and start buying things. It has to be uh, released, okay? And so that is the process, the, the budget timeline. I see that Terry has jumped in with a question about releasing funds. So can you see that, Laura? Oh, yeah, I wrote an answer, and of course, I didn't send it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's read her question first. Release okay. should specify amounts or just fund line items? They should definitely uh, specify the amount. So ordinarily, a motion would be, I move to release funds not to exceed $1,000 for the carnival. And so it should include the budget line item and the amount. And uh, this is because you may not be releasing all of uh, the funds for the carnival. This just may, may be for a contract for a bounce house or whatever that has to be paid earlier, but the actual budget may be $10,000. So you're not required to release the whole budget for any particular line item, but what you will need before the next association meeting. And um, yeah. And so uh, release of funds, as we said, or maybe we didn't say yet, 
uh, guarantees that the money is in the bank. So uh, we're not running around spending money just because we have an approved budget program, but we release the funds because we know that we have that money in the bank that we can uh, spend for that uh, particular program. I don't see any other questions in the chat. I'm gonna to toss up a poll, but if you do think of any other questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Go ahead and put your best answers in there and then we'll review them afterwards. Maybe about 15 more seconds. So we have a majority of people have answered already. All righty, here we go. I'm doing a poll. And let's go ahead and share the results. Okay. Uh, do you want to go over this, Laura? Um, sure. Um, for the most part, I would say that most units need to make summer payments. You know, they have to pay for that spirit where you have that meet and greet coming up in um, August and uh, you need to... Uh, to buy that inventory of spirit wear. So it should be as soon as possible after the election of the new board so that you have time, you take your last association meeting date, you back into your uh, board meeting for that date and then arrange a couple of uh, budget committee and board elect meetings. So you have to back into that last association meeting date in order to release funds. I wanna say to be sure to keep minutes of your budget committee meetings and uh, your board elect meetings. That's important to know. Uh, just as any other board meeting or um, association meeting, you want to keep minutes in order to uh, officialize what's been discussed and uh, for your own protection as the board members. Um, only elected board members may serve on the budget committee. Uh, no, that's false. Uh, we're saying uh, what we need to do at our, at our first board elect meeting is to make appointments. And these are board members who are not elected, but rather appointed by the president and approved by the board. This can be your parliamentarian, your corresponding secretary. And in some cases, it's the, uh, for example, spirit wear chairperson. That may not be an elected position. That may be a chairperson, a standing committee. Hospitality uh, could be an appointment. It's not an elected uh, position. So your elected positions are specified in your bylaws, but also appointed uh, positions for standing committees and, and that sort of thing. So you want everybody as much as possible on the board because they're all board members, whether they're elected or appointed. So you want that expertise available to you when you're preparing your budget uh, to have as many uh, people as possible to choose from that have uh, you know, uh, information that would be valuable to the budget process. So elected and appointed members of the board may participate in the budget committee. And I'm just gonna jump in and add a little bit more to that first question about when is the best time to start working on the budget. Uh, we kind of threw that question in there because I'm sure that new officers, they're always getting it pounded into their heads that, okay, you guys start on July 1st right? July 1st is mm -hmm. the start of your term, um, which, well, that's true. Um, the, the elected board doesn't get to, um, say, start spending money, have control of the checkbook, whatever, until um, after their term starts. However, uh, it's best to prepare before then so that you can really be ready to hit the ground running uh, when once July 1st arrives and, you know, definitely, um, you know, definitely before, before the beginning of the school year, but even again, during the summer, if there is stuff that needs to be paid over the course of the summer. Uh, 
And I think we can move on to the next uh, video. The next video will be monitoring the budget and spending, and that will be your slides seven through nine. Okay, on this slide, as you can see, this is the nice flow chart that we love because it's a graphic illustration of whether we can write the check. But as you can see, the very first um, box is, is this expense in the approved budget? Um, so it's very important that the expenses are in their budget. And if it is, then boom, you go over to the right and follow down to see whether you can write the check. Get, make sure all the authorizations and signatures are in place. If it's not, then is, if the expense has been approved by the board, then you might still be able to write the check. Otherwise, no go, you can't write the check. So um, that's part of why the budget is so important. Um, so on the next slide, we have the spending money. Is it budgeted? Were the funds released by the association? Was it authorized by the board? Um, are the payment authorizations request for reimbursements all filled out and ready to go? Are the receipts and invoices attached? And let's go back and talk about releasing um, money. Um, if it's already in the budget, you still can't necessarily spend it until you have released it at the association meeting. And you should only release what you are anticipating spending until the next um, association meeting. So, um, for instance, if you, um, the candidates forum, if you might, you might have $500 budgeted, but you're only going to spend $100 until the next association meeting. So you only need to release that amount. Um, most of these other amounts, um, like the student planners usually pay that all at once. So you, you kind of try to think ahead and figure out what expenses are coming up between now and the next association meeting and just release what you need to get through that. Now, sometimes you might be happy having a fundraiser. I remember we once had a eighth grade fundraiser that we didn't actually have the fundraiser yet. So we didn't know how much money we had. So then we said something like, I re we release the funds for eighth grade promotion up to the amount earned by the fundraiser. So, I mean, sometimes you have to do some interesting releases like that, but um, otherwise it's pretty straightforward. And on the next slide, we have a sample budget actual report. This is an important report that should be run at least every quarter um, so that your board and association can see what's going on with budget versus actual. Um, I like to run it monthly because it's usually a, it is a canned report from um, PT Easy and many other accounting programs. Probably it's a, it's a standard report. So it's pretty easy to run every month and just make sure that you're still within budget um, and make sure that um, like your membership dues income and what you've forwarded on to the next level is the same amount. And if it's not, then you owe a check to somebody. Um, so that's um, a way to tell how much you owe. Um, it's also at the end of the year, a great report because it's actually an option for the annual financial report. And it can also be, it's very helpful to be used um, to help prepare your taxes, especially the CTTR-1. And it's um, great to help for during the audits too, to get a snapshot of various things. And, um, it's also good for the IRS guidelines uh, for 501c3s. Like to see a report that shows where the entity has spent the money and that they can operate within their budgets and, and spend their money according to their taxes on purpose. So this is a great report for that. And budgets can be amended with the approval of the association. It has to be a two thirds vote and it's a, if you see that you've budgeted $500 for something and it's already September and you've spent 400, but you know you need to spend at least two or $300 more, it's not a problem. You can update the budget, um, go through everything, make sure you're still within line and uh, increase or decrease where you need to and present it to the association. 
And as long as they approve it with two thirds vote, you're good to go. And there's also, you can refer to the toolkit at capta.org, finance budgeting, amending the budget for more information. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, we do have a, a little bit of time. So, oh, look, I spoke too soon. There's Terry with a question. <laughs> Should you revise your approved budget uh, mid-year or quarterly? Does this revision need to be approved by just executive board or association? Go ahead, so um, the budget is a plan. It's not a, a transaction. So like every plan, things change and they have to be revised. Um, your revisions can be quarterly, uh, but it should be when they're needed. So someone, uh, the treasurer, maybe look at that budget to actual monthly, and there may need to be a change that's not necessarily quarterly or whatever. So it should be revised uh, whenever known and, and it needs to be done. And it will be brought up initially, the revision to the budget, to the plan, to the executive board for approval or rather for a recommendation. The board never approves anything. They make board recommendations. And so the board will uh, make a board recommendation to the association and it's up to the association to approve, like Mary said, the uh, revisions with a two thirds vote. But if you're not changing your budget pretty regularly, uh, something is wrong because uh, we cannot predict you know, a perfect plan for the year. So the board is doing a good job exercising their fiduciary responsibility by reviewing and uh, updating the budget uh, as it needs to be. Okay, so seeing as there are no other questions in the chat, um, um, Mary did go briefly beyond sort of the scope of the budget and into the, the process of approving um, spending transactions in general. So um, we have a couple minutes if anyone had any questions about that. Now would be an okay time to throw that in. Um, in the meantime, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, toss up the next poll. And if you guys think of anything along these lines, that would be fine. Let me make sure yeah. I, just I just want to mention also in the meantime, while you're putting up the polls, yes. this, the uh, can we write this check um, um, little chart there. That also includes, can we authorize a payment through EFT? We're not gonna go through that process of EFT payments, but just know that when it comes up that all of the um, policies and procedures that apply to check requests also apply to electronic funds transfers. Okay, so the poll is up. We'll leave that up there for a little bit. But yes, it is important to be monitoring the budget throughout the year. And that's gonna pretty much fall on financial officers since they're the ones seeing all the transactions and you have access to the budget um, documents. Here we go. Okay, Susan says, should all the money be budgeted somewhere or is it okay to put some in an unbudgeted line item? If so, how much can that be? Um, that is whatever your association approves, but no, you don't have to budget all of the money that you have. Uh, in fact, it's wise not to because you should have, uh, I think you're referring to a reserve or some unallocated funds. You should have uh, money in there in case something comes up and you may want to allocate funds later in the year for something that the association approves. So you should have an unallocated amount. What that is, um, I mean, it shouldn't be, you know, outrageous, but it should be reasonable, you know, that, that you're not trying to accumulate funds, you know, and not spending on uh, student programs and whatnot. So it should be reasonable, but yes, you should have a reserve. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now, because it seems like most people have 
responded and let's share the results. Okay. Can you see that, Laura? Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, I got a little mixture here. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> once the budget is approved by the association, a chairperson uh, may make purchases for their approved program. And remember, we talked about release of funds. Um, you may approve a budget that will expend $50,000, but you may only have $20,000 in the bank. So obviously you can't say, okay, everybody, you're all approved, you know, go on out there and, and buy things because you don't have enough money to pay for all of the uh, commitments or programs that were approved. Uh, this would be to depend on revenue coming in later as in the form of fundraising or program spirit or whatever. So it's really kind of a cash flow situation where timing is everything. You cannot spend more money uh, than you have in the bank. So you kind of time when money is coming in, when money is going out. And also you should release funds just enough uh, for anticipated expenditures until your next association meeting. Okay. Uh, yes, true, 100%. Funds may be released for less than the budgeted amount for reasons that we said, the carnival uh, example. So congratulations to everybody for getting Yay. that one right. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, third question is the original adopted budget, the subsequent revised budgets, and the budget versus actual reports must be maintained and attached to the meeting minutes because they, and they have multiple possible answers. So the um, first possible response is provide historical value. Um, the second one was pr protect the board members and demonstrate their fiduciary responsibility. The third one is um, because they may be used to protect the tax exempt status of the unit. And the fourth one is must be, they must be submitted to the Department of Justice with the RRF1 form at year end. Okay, um, the uh, budgets, the budget to actual reports and the original budgets provide historical value, that's true. And it will also protect uh, board members uh, because you know down the line, someone's gonna say, oh my goodness, uh, we didn't approve that. And you will see in your historical budgets, oh, okay, in this uh, and in the minutes also, uh, any kind of budget revisions must be recorded in the minutes also. We wanna make sure about that. But that's to protect the board members to say, oh, okay, on January 15th meeting, we did change that budget to uh, increase it or whatever. So it has historical value also, because when you want to prepare future budgets, you may want to look at what the original budget was. You have your original budget and then your revised budget because things that happened during last year to revise the budget may not uh, apply in the next year. So historical value is important when you're preparing your uh, current year budget to know what happened before. Uh, again, the second one, protect the board members and demonstrate their fiduciary responsibility. And we talked about uh, how revising the budget, reviewing the budget, uh, reviewing the plan uh, is uh, and demonstrates the good fiduciary responsibility of the board members to keep that plan current and to fund any shortfalls. For example, they may have overexpended in a line item, that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, if you are overexpending your line items, you may run out of money. Uh, so that's true. B is true. C may be used to protect the tax exempt status of the unit. And we talked about uh, this budget to actual report is very good for the uh, annual treasurer's financial report. And there's also a form called um, UTAR. And uh, this is not PTA asking for this report. This is the IRS as a 501c3 organization is required to file an annual report. It doesn't go to the IRS. It's kept hopefully on the, um, on the campuses and also at the council and the district. And the reason why they have this, as Mary uh, said, is to uh, see that uh, funds are being expended for the tax exempt purpose and the unit is living within its means. But it will be the first thing, if the IRS uh, wants to do an audit on the unit, this will be the first thing they will ask for, is the uh, budget to actual annual financial report. 
So you want to make sure that you keep this budget to action report if you use it as your uh, annual financial report, uh, because it will it may come up later. And so you want to make sure you have that. Uh, the last one must be submitted to the Department of Justice with the RF1. No, that's not true. Uh, if you have an RF1, uh, your 990 easy tax return will be um, sent, sent with that if you've done that. But your CTTR1, if you make $50,000 or less, you file a postcard, the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board, could give a rat's patoot how... how, how <laughs> How, how your money was spent and stuff. But the state of California, the Department of Justice wants to know that. And so they introduced a couple of uh, years ago uh, that we need to show exactly where the money came in and where it was spent. So this is a Department of Justice, but the budget to actual is not required to be submitted with the RF1. Um, there are some questions in the chat, but I think we'll hold off just to make sure that we get our last video clip in. Um, so um, if we may try and answer those in the chat and come back to them, but uh, in the meantime, let's do the last clip. Okay, the last video clip is other things to look out for, and that will be your slide 10. Okay, so just to wrap it up, we have uh, just several miscellaneous um, points that we wanted to um, emphasize before we leave. Um, First of all, you gotta make sure that when you're developing your budget, that fundraising is not the goal. First, you wanna plan out your board's goals, what you wanna do for um, the kids at your school, um, your community. And then once you figure out exactly what your goals are, then you go ahead and figure out what kind of fundraising you need to do in order to be able to accomplish those goals. And so there's a rule of thumb called the three to one rule um, that says, and I'm quoting from the toolkit here, there should be at least three non-fundraising programs aimed at helping parents or children or advocating for school improvements for every one fundraiser. So that may seem like kind of an unfair ratio, but just keep in mind that there are low cost programs that you can do that rely more on volunteer power than on actual money. So we did have a few examples of those in our sample budget, like the Reflections program, which is just sort of an arts participation program. And so, you know, you would probably need to buy certificates and ribbons, but that's actually a fairly low cost for something that is available to all of your students. So if you think about programs like that, that can actually um, be beneficial to the school, but don't cost a lot, that's great. So for the second bullet point, you should not use PTA funds for personal gifts. And the toolkit, uh, the link there sort of explains um, in, in detail, but I'm just gonna read a small excerpt that personal gifts include gift cards and gifts for baby showers, Secretary's Day bereavements, weddings or birthdays. Um, so um, even though you may think, oh, well, our former PTA president, she did so much for PTA and it's her birthday. So we should recognize that. Yes, you can recognize that, but just not with PTA funds. So if it's something uh, that's important to you as a board or to your membership in general, then that's a thing where you kind of pass the hat and collect um, personal donations in order to um, carry that, you know, pay for that gift, okay? Um, third bullet point, do not overspend on hospitality or teacher, staff, volunteer appreciation. And I'm gonna focus on the example of teacher appreciation because I think that's something where it's kind of easy for PTAs to get a little carried away, um, but the total amount of your hospitality for the year. That includes any hospitality at meetings, um, teacher appreciation, staff appreciation, uh, volunteer appreciation, any special events should, according to the IRS, be, quote, not of a significant amount. So that's a little bit vague, sort of rule of thumb that we've been using has been 
that your total amount of hospitality should not exceed 5% of your annual budget. So there's a lot of detail at the links attached. So um, just, just, just kind of keep that in mind that yes, sure you want to recognize your teachers, but you've got to make sure that you don't go overboard. Okay. Now <clears throat> for the same thing, do not overspend on legislative activities. I'm going to take a moment to give a shout out to advocacy work because that's something that PTA was actually founded on was um, advocating for for hot lunches, for universal kindergarten, uh, for a juvenile justice system. So that that's something that's very important and it, it actually tends to be overlooked. But um, again, also for IRS reasons, you don't want to overspend on that. So um, they have some examples of advocacy that are low cost in the toolkit. Um, but just specifically regarding the guidelines for spending, um, to retain its IRS tax exempt status and continue to receive tax deductible deductions, a PTA may not participate in any type of political campaign or other activity on behalf of or in opposition to a candidate for any office. And then, nor may a PTA devote more than an insubstantial part of its volunteer activity and expenditures to influence the outcome of ballot measures and other legislation. So being for or against a specific candidate for office is a total no-no. PTA can advocate for um, stuff that's beneficial to youth and children. And on the PTA website, there's a list of platforms that uh, kind of uh, give guidelines as far as what PTA is in support of. So you can refer to that. Um, but again, you just want to make sure you limit that. And next bullet point, be careful about making gifts to the school. Um, you wanna make sure that um, if PTA agrees to fund, say an equipment purchase, it's best to actually donate the money to the school or the school district so that they can make the actual purchase. They can be in the future responsible for any liability or any maintenance that's that's involved with that piece of equipment. Um, also, when you're making a gift to the school or the school district, you will want to complete a fiduciary agreement form, which is available on the website that um, sort of stipulates that this money that we're donating needs to be used for this exact purpose. And if it's not, then the money will come back to PTA. So that's all presented in greater detail at that link, but just want to make you aware of that. And then the last but not least point, following PTA budget and financial procedures helps protect your PTA. Now, um, for those of you who are incoming treasurers, a lot of times treasurers are seen as the gatekeeper to the funds and maybe you'll end up getting buttonholed by someone saying, oh, hey, can PTA pay for this great project I have in mind? This whole procedure with the budget and getting your board's agreement and your association's agreement on what PTA funds should be spent on, that ensures that no one person uh, has to be responsible for any decisions. So if you're in a situation where your, say your school's principal comes to you and says, oh, hey, can PTA um, pay for this project? And all you have to do is kind of go back to your whole financial procedure, starting with the budget. Oh, was this something we budgeted for? Yes or no. If it's not, then then that needs and that request would need to go through that whole budget approval process. Um, so even though you as a treasurer would be one to that 
controls the checkbook, you don't can really control the funds. It all needs to go through the board, and that's to protect you and and all the officers on the board um, from being responsible for rash decisions. And just going to reemphasize that point that every PTA board member has a responsibility to protect the assets of the organization. And these assets include cash, assets, volunteers, and the PTA's reputation. So just kind of keep that in mind. And that's why we have all these sort of seemingly complicated rules and procedures is just so that you as a volunteer, as an officer, you're protected from any unpleasant um, consequences. Okay, so that was me on my soapbox <laughs> about uh, um, making sure that uh, PTA funds are, are treated properly. Um, are, are there any questions in the chat? Here, I'm just gonna start from, from the last one that, that we answered out loud. Um, if the board needs to recommend a budget change before the next association meeting, can the purchase expense be made before the association meets again? Yes, the board has the ability to budget uh, and uh, to expend funds between association meetings, and that is in your bylaws. And there is a certain the amount is based upon the number of association meetings that you have during the year. So the amount increases if you have less association meetings because there's a longer time in between those meetings. So for example, in your bylaws, you have your association meetings and we'll say, okay, $500, the uh, board may budget and expand between association meetings if you have association meetings every month. It increases to $750 if you have, and I'm just on the top of my head, maybe five, six meetings a year. If you only have maybe three or less meetings a year, then they're authorized to budget and expend $1,000 um, between association meetings. But of course, at the next association meeting, those uh, budget expended items have to be approved. So the board has some leeway for maybe emergency expenses or something that's not been anticipated uh, that they can take care of in between association meetings. Okay, okay. what's the next one? The next one is the release of funds should be done at association meetings, not board meetings. I know. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> no, the release of funds ordinarily should be done at the board meeting first, because uh, they can discuss the need, they can discuss the money in the bank, you know, it, it's best to come up at the board meeting first, and then uh, it will be uh, presented to the association as a board recommendation. So the recording secretary, let's say they have a list of uh, releases of funds, they will say the board approved and I move to release funds, not to exceed blah, blah, blah. These, uh, Board recommendations do not require a second. You know, ordinarily to say I move someone seconds. It doesn't need a second because it's already been discussed. So you don't need a second to say, oh, I'm willing to talk about that, you know, because they've already been discussed. And so, uh, but that's not to say that release of funds cannot be uh, voted upon initially at the association. You can do that too. It's just easier if the board does it and then presents it to the association, but you can go either way. Okay, um, the next question was budget revisions in minutes, can they just be the new revised budget or do specifics of any and all changes need to be identified and recorded? I think this should be um, treated similarly to the treasury reports. You know how you have your treasury reports every month and you should include in the minutes, the beginning cash balance, total disbursements, total receipts, ending cash balance. And then you attach your treasury reports to the minutes. The, the reason why we record in the minutes is if the treasury report is detached and you know it's not found. And at least we have that uh, recording saying that the association of the board has been informed of the treasurer's report and has been presented. So I would say similarly to uh, budget revisions, I would say in your minutes, record the line item, the original amount, 
any increase or decrease in the ending amount. And then attach your budget act your new budget actual report to the minutes. Uh, but in case it gets detached, the information is recorded in the minutes. Okay, that seems to be it. I'm going to kick off our last poll, um, but still, if you have any questions, feel free to keep asking them. Just want to point out that question number two, you can uh, give multiple answers. Okay, let me go ahead and end the poll now. You ready? And share the results. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> on the budget, the projected current year revenue must be greater than the projected current year expense. You can't report a loss. Uh, that is not true. You can report a loss uh, because we talked about uh, maybe we have uh, a large carryover cash balance uh, because of some uh, uh, successful fundraising the year before that we didn't have an opportunity to expend. So you can report a loss in a current year as long as it's supported by your beginning cash balance. You cannot report a loss uh, if, if you're showing that you don't have the money in the bank to cover that. So uh, that's how we spend down uh, cash balances is by reporting losses in current years. So um, E-commerce fees may be budgeted. Uh, this is a decision that can be, can be um, presented and approved by the uh, a recommendation by the board and the association because it really depends. The only thing it is not is, um, uh, is that it's included in net revenue. No, you cannot include any kind of fee in uh, a revenue line item and call it net proceeds, net revenue or whatever. A fee is an operating expense and has to be reported as, as an expense. Um, the choice here is organizational expense, yes, or it could be a fundraising or program expense. So it depends on how your unit is set up. Like for example, if you have a square store that takes in uh, memberships, um, spirit wear, donations, you know, you have a store that you can do all this, then more than likely, it's a lot of work to divide up the fee between those different programs. You can do that, but another um, um, option is to make an organizational expense just to make it easier, but you can split that up too. It can be a fundraising expense and a program expense because uh, it may be unique to a fundraiser or program. For example, Spiritware is a program and all you sell is Spiritware on uh, PayPal or a Square account or whatever, then that could be an operating expense to the Spiritware program as opposed to an organizational expense. So uh, that's really a choice uh, that can be made by uh, the board and the association. But it can be an organizational expense, a fundraising expense, or a program expense. All righty, thank you. So are there any more questions? We still have a little time. Okay. If not, would you go ahead and wrap this up, Mary? All right. Well, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have learned some valuable information. For more information about PTA finances, you can visit our website, 33rdpta.org and the California State PTA website, capta.org. People refer to that as CAPTA. 
And if you have additional questions or ideas for topics that you would like to like us to provide training on, please email PTA training at 33rd PTA.org. And um, again, thank you for coming. <laughs>